Must I go and empty-handed, thus my dear Redeemer meet? Not one day of service give him, lay no trophy at his feet? Must I go and empty-handed, must I meet my Saviour so? Not one soul with which to greet him, must I empty-handed go? Not at death I shrink or falter, for my Saviour saves me now. But to meet him empty-handed, thought of that now clouds my brow. Oh, the years in sinning wasted, could I but recall them now, I would give them to my Saviour, to his will I'd gladly bow. O ye saints, arouse, be earnest, up and work while yet tis day, ere the night of death o'ertake thee, strived for souls while still you may. Must I go and empty-handed stands as a profound hymnal query, stirring the soul of every believer with a deep-seated concern. What will our hands hold when we stand before the Lord? Will they be filled with the fruits of a life devoted to his service? Or will they hang by our sides, empty and wanting? This hymn, penned by Charles C. Luther in the 19th century, emerges from a heart-wrenching encounter with a young man on the threshold of eternity. This young man on his deathbed lamented his life he spent apart from Christ's calling. This hymn was inspired by a story about a young man who was about to die. He feared the moment of meeting his Savior, not for the encounter itself, but for the absence of any souls led to Christ through his influence. Luther, struck by the young man's profound remorse, Luther wrote this hymn to express how important it is to live a life that helps spread God's message. In simple terms, this young man at his deathbed thought of the years he wasted, not bringing one single soul to Christ. In simple terms, this song came from a story about a young man who was close to dying. He was worried about meeting Jesus because he hadn't helped anyone else to believe in Jesus. And I wonder how many Christians are like this young man. They haven't brought a single person to know Christ. Unfortunately for some Christians, it's too late for them to preach the gospel message or introduce people to Christ, but it is not too late for you. What I have seen in my years in ministry is that there are a tremendous number of Christians with the heaven for us and hell for them attitude. These Christians are indeed saved and they sleep at night with the assurance of salvation. They live their lives knowing that if they were to die at this very moment, they are going to heaven. Yet there are people around them, people that they meet on a daily basis who are doomed for hell, people who are heading to the very gates of hell. Yet they do not share the wonderful message of the gospel and the message from a holy God. Heaven for us, hell for them. 150,000 souls worldwide die each day. For argument's sake, let's say 20% of them are true born again believers. That means each and every day, 130,000 people pass one by one into the very gates of hell, eternal hell. One by one, they're entering eternal darkness. If God allowed us Christians to see just a 10 second snapshot of hell, it would be impossible for us Christians to ever live a normal, lazy Christian life again. If we saw a glimpse of hell, we would have a sense of urgency, an urgency for the souls of mankind. For if you truly believe the word of God is true, and this word of God warns us about hell, why are we so casual with the souls of mankind? Eternity. Our minds cannot grasp eternity. Our minds cannot fully comprehend eternity. And there are people who, you know, and I know, who are heading to eternal darkness. And we have a casual attitude towards preaching the gospel. There are parents right now who are saved, but their children are not. There are husbands who are saved and their wives are not. There are best friends who are saved and their best friend, their closest friend, is not. Elizabeth Elliot's story is one of incredible faith, forgiveness and dedication to spreading the gospel, even in the face of profound personal loss. 
Her journey into the heart of forgiveness began with a tragic event that shook the Christian world. In 1956, her husband, Jim Elliott, along with four other missionaries, was killed by the Huarani people, also known as the Huarani or Auca in Ecuador. These men had gone into the Ecuadorian jungle with the hope of sharing the Christian faith with this isolated tribe, known for their violence against outsiders. Rather than responding with anger or seeking revenge for her husband's death, Elizabeth Elliot chose the path of forgiveness and reconciliation. In an astonishing act of faith and courage, she, along with her young daughter Valerie and Rachel Saint, the sister of Nate Saint, one of the murdered missionaries, decided to live among the Huaorani tribe. This decision was driven by her deep commitment to the mission that had brought her family to Ecuador in the first place, to share the love and salvation offered by Jesus Christ. That is a true woman of God. Within the quiet moments of reflection, a question haunts the corridors of our souls. Will we enter the gates of heaven empty-handed without a single soul brought into the kingdom because of our witness? This haunting thought should stir us from complacency, for we have been charged with a mission of eternal consequence, the Great Commission. Time, indeed, is a river swiftly flowing to its end and we stand on its banks, holding the lifeline that could save many from the waters of eternal separation. Consider the lives we brush against daily, each with an eternal destiny. The cashier at the grocery store, the neighbor across the street, the colleague at work, souls teetering on the edge of eternity without Christ. Yet how often do we pass by, silent in our witness, our lips sealed by fear or indifference. The reality is stark. Every day, thousands step into eternity without hope, without salvation. If we truly grasp this truth, how can we remain silent? The Apostle Paul's words echo with urgency. How, then, can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Romans 10.14 Our calling is clear. We are to be the heralds of the gospel, the messengers of good news in a world ensnared by darkness. Yet do we live as if this truth burns within our hearts? Or have we grown comfortable, content to bask in the assurance of our salvation while neglecting the desperate need of those around us? The thought of entering heaven's glory empty-handed without companions we've led to the Lord is a sobering one. It challenges us to examine our lives, our priorities, and our obedience to Christ's command to go and make disciples. This is not a call to earn our salvation, for it is a gift freely given, but a call to respond to that gift with lives of purposeful witness and love. The fields are ripe for harvest, yet the laborers are few. We are surrounded by a sea of humanity drowning in despair, searching for hope. And we hold the answer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But will we share it? Will we reach out with the love and compassion of Christ to those who are lost? Or will we, through our silence and inaction, allow them to slip into eternity without ever hearing the saving message of the gospel. Our mission is urgent, for time is indeed short. The clock ticks steadily toward the moment when each of us will stand before God. What will our answer be when he asks us what we did with the gospel? Did we share it freely, living as beacons of hope in a darkened world? Or did we hide it away keeping the treasure of salvation to ourselves. Let this moment be a turning point, a call to awaken from spiritual slumber and to embrace the commission Christ has given us with renewed passion and commitment. Let us not be content with merely securing our place in heaven, but be driven by a love for Christ 
and for those he came to save, to share the gospel boldly and tirelessly. As we ponder our journey to heaven, let it not be a solitary one. Instead, may we be surrounded by a host of souls who are there because we dared to share the love and truth of Jesus Christ. The question remains, not just for contemplation, but for action. Are we going to heaven alone, or will we take many with us, snatched from the fires of hell through our witness and testimony? The choice is ours, and the time to act is now. It is too late for some Christians to share the gospel, but it is not too late for you.